Hello, everybody. I'm Jacob Wilkins. Great to be with you on this edition of Alumni Bearcat Chats and a pleasure to be joined by award-winning theatrical composer, lyricist, and producer, Neil Berg, a proud Binghamton graduate from 1986. Neil, great to have you with us. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Jacob. Of course. Tell me, let's start. You grew up in Rockland County. Uh, you were recruited to play baseball at Binghamton. How did that all come about? You know, it's so funny. I, I always talk about how you you make 17-year-old decisions. You know, that's really what we're doing when you're thinking about college. And uh, I was actually heavily recruited to play at Columbia University in New York City. My father had a business uh, a couple of blocks away from Columbia. I really didn't love New York City back in, that, in those days. It was a little grimier. It's mm -hmm. certainly not what it is now. And uh, out of nowhere... Uh, honestly, I got a call from the coach of, uh, you know, the baseball head baseball coach from Binghamton University. And it was another school I had applied to. I'd never visited. And um, he called me and said, hey, I, I see you. You know, uh, we would love for you to come and play baseball here and you'll come in and start as a freshman. And I knew at Columbia, I had known their roster. I knew I probably wouldn't get a shot until I was a junior to be a full time starter. And I knew that one of my uh, one of the best baseball players I've ever seen in Rockland County, his name was Dan Talkin, who was from Clarkstown North, uh, who was a year mm -hmm. ahead of me, was at Binghamton. Uh, and I, I couldn't believe that. I figured it must be a phenomenal baseball school if Dan Talkin was there. <laughs> and I, I hung up the phone and I said, hey, Dad, I, I, I think I'm going to Binghamton University <laughs> to play Sight baseball. Sight unseen. Yeah, sight unseen. And I had known some people who had gone there. I knew it was a terrific school. I, everybody told me that it was the Ivies of the, you know, the state system. I knew it was a terrific school. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I, I knew that Dan was there. So that was really the 17 year old decision I made. And I'm thankful for it because it changed my life in the best way possible because of eventually what happened, not, really not baseball, but it's really what, where I got introduced to theater. Well, that's a perfect segue uh, of how did you get introduced to theater at, at the university? <laughs> so, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, through high school and uh, I, I always played the piano. I always loved it. I was always, quote unquote, serious. I played rock bands and stage bands. But, you know, when you're in high school, you had to make a choice. You, you, you Both the spring musical and baseball were a spring activity, and you weren't allowed to do both, at least not at my high school. So, I, of course, I chose baseball. I had done theater in junior high. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to college, I kept, uh, kept up with playing the piano, and I was playing in all the talent shows. I got a band together, and I was, uh, you know, there weren't a ton of people who played the piano, so I was heavily recruited by other students. And, uh, you know, so I was having the time of my life and then somebody finally asked me to write a musical my junior year. Now I was already an all state center fielder and all SUNYAC, whatever they called it. But I love telling story. I was actually an English major. I thought that was the best way because I thought I was, well, my parents, I was supposed to take over my great uncle's law practice. <laughs> if it was up to them. And uh, I wrote my first musical and then it was put on by the university. Uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, I had some great mentors who took me under their wing. And it was presented my senior year of college, uh, produced by the university, directed by a professor. And some uh, one of the professors saw the sh my musical, and he worked for the professional theater up in Binghamton. It was called the Cider Mill Playhouse. And uh, he asked me to come down and write uh, a score for a professional show. And then that went well. And they asked me to write a second one. So within a year, I had gone from never writing a musical to having a show produced and then writing professionally. And that's when I said to my parents, uh, goodbye law school. I want to write Broadway musicals. <laughs> they had a heart attack. Uh, and I followed with uh, the conviction and passion and determination of, of really what I played baseball with. It was, to me, a competition with myself to see how good I could get. And none of this was through uh, traditional coursework. This was all sort of on your own initiative and, and extracurricular. Correct. And I, I always, you know, told students, you know, whenever I do a master class, it's amazing. Just colleges for experiences. 
while I was at Binghamton, another two big, uh, two other things happened that I think are, are, are paramount to, to this conversation. One was that uh, I lived in College of the Woods and they needed to raise money. And so I took it upon myself to create a concert. I would get friends of mine who could sing. I put the shows together. I played the piano. I produced it. I musical directed it. My friends would sing. I would narrate it. And it was called Ice Cream Parlor. And people would come and buy ice cream. They'd come to the show, pack it in, buy ice cream, and we raise money for the dorm through these musical shows that I was doing, these reviews. Now, that directly led. That's what I did as a, a freshman and sophomore in college. And that translated into the other arm of what I do now. Because now, besides writing the musicals, for the last 20 years, I've had the number one touring Broadway review across the country. And it all started no different than what I was doing in College in the Woods. The other thing was my freshman year, I had to get back to the dorm after baseball practice, not to the dorm, but to the dining hall in College in the Woods. I was going to be late. If I was late, I was going to have dinner. So I ran and I ran through a building I'd never seen before, the Fine Arts Building. And uh, there I couldn't get through because there were people on the floor. It was crowded because people were there signed up for. I, I said, what's going on? They said, it's piano auditions for Professor Fink and Professor Ponce for the music department. I was like, oh, what do you do? They said, well, you have to play for the jury. I was like, what the hell is a jury? But I was in my baseball uniform. I signed up. I went in there. <laughs> they, they, I played the closest thing to a classical piece I knew, which was a song called The Clap by Yes. And lo and behold, I got into the program. And I'm still friends with that professor to this day. So once again, I just saw the opportunity and said, let's go for it. So uh, once again, that directly led to what I'm doing now. Wow, so much so much there. And, and clearly there's a theme here, Neil, of you taking initiative uh, during your time at Binghamton. And so that leads us perfectly into you becoming Colonial Woody. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I, as you can tell, in college, excuse me, in high school, I was voted most enthusiastic. Yeah. I've always been very passionate. I've always been, you know, outward, uh, you know, that personality. When I got up to Binghamton, I was kind of horrified to see the apathy towards the basketball team and how students weren't showing up to games. And I quickly joined uh, the Student Athletic Council. And this guy I met, uh, uh, Bill Palelo, was the head of it. And Bill, who is now a dear, dear friend of mine, yeah. was the mascot of the school, Colonial Bill. And I went to see him shoot people, you know, do his antics at the games. The only thing that was missing from Bill, I, he was terrific, but there was no one there to see him. And when he graduated, you know, and we only overlapped one year, I was like, they asked me if I would want to do it. I said, sure. But me being in the theater sense and the impresario, which I didn't even know I was at the time, I was like, we've got to get more people to the game. I hate this apathy. And I felt there was a way to change it. And so I guess there's living proof that you can do it. Yeah, you can do it if you want to. There's just, but it was more for me. You know, I, 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 I say that selfishly. I, I didn't like the apathy. So I wanted something different. So how could I change it? And you're an entertainer. I mean, this was a perfect match. Right, without, without even knowing that's where my life was going. Yeah, right. that was my sophomore year I took that over. Tell me, uh, you and Tim Sinicki, uh teammates, right? Yes. Uh, he came into the school. Uh, it, he was a terrific pitcher and a local product. Yep. And I will tell you this about Tim Sinicki. Um, Not that I have to tell you. It's just the truth. Everyone, everyone liked Tim Sinicki from day one. Um, he's just a, a, he was a nice guy. He kept it, he was quiet to start with. He couldn't believe the shenanigans and the personalities on our team. We had a lot of personalities. And he came there and he just uh he just pitched and pitched well. And uh when he when it when we found out that it was Tim taking over the baseball program, um, all of us 
were thrilled. It made so much sense. He had the, uh, you know, the knowledge. He had the personality to get along with everybody, but he was not a pushover. And he had community roots and went to the university. And we're all, I, every time I, 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 every once in a while out of the blue, I'll just text him and just tell, how, tell him how proud we are of him because he really has brought the baseball program to the baseball promised land. It's amazing what he's accomplished at the university, especially going division three to division one and being able to navigate that and finding how to recruit the right players. It's much harder to get people to the Northeast, no less Binghamton, you know, uh, with all the schools <laughs> down South. So yeah, we, nothing, nothing but the most uh, uh, utmost respect. And I'm just in awe of what Tim Sinicki has done as the head coach of Binghamton and all of his assistants he's brought in. I imagine also it gives you great pride to see uh, what is going to be just a jewel of a stadium here. Yes. It's, you know, every time we go up, uh, I go up for my Binghamton alumni baseball weekend and I'm privy to uh, what's going on. So it was amazing what, uh, what happened, you know, even before this, I mean, the, the university in the field was unbelievable. And then of course, to get that, anonymous donation, I could tell you, it's remarkable that Binghamton University is going to have one of the best baseball complexes in the United States of America, period. When I look at your career, obviously 100 years of Broadway, 50 years of rock and roll. What was the moment though, and those are obviously for those that don't know, your very successful touring shows um, amongst other productions. When was the moment that you really felt like you had uh, achieved that a certain level of success that you had made it? Oh my gosh. Well, so I had been in my twenties, I was the quintessential starving artist because I was planting seeds. I didn't know anybody in the business. And there were a couple of times where things like that happened my parents, you know, didn't get what I was doing. They kind of tuned out and I, I, I my parents were great. I love them. We had a great childhood. Don't anybody ever think there was, they just didn't understand it. And so it was difficult for them because they worried about their little boy, but I knew, I thought I knew what I was doing. I put a review of my music together. And it played at a small cabaret space and won my, I won my first award. Uh, it was called a Bistro Award for this, uh, the music of Neil Berg. And the star of Family of the Opera was in my show in my 20s. And my father finally came to see the show. My mother and father came to see the show. And uh, they couldn't believe these singers, you know, these Broadway stars singing my music. And the star of Phantom went up to my father and said, you're Neil Berg's father. Oh my God, what a thrill it is to meet you. You must be so proud. He's, you know, he's all this and that. And I could see my father <laughs> looking like, oh, maybe, maybe he made the right choice. So that was one that, that was just kind of the father, mother, son, that in that, in terms of financially, I had been doing some really good things in my twenties and, and uh, writing some corporate work and I was doing my my shows these shows for IBM and uh for uh, Goldman Sachs and we were we were able to get into what was called the private sector of doing our shows at all their corporate events and those are well-paying events but I wanted to do something bigger so when I finally was able to find the right producing partner to bring it out on tour uh I'll spare the details of, of how that started. It's an interesting story, but just let's say we were able to get into certain theaters, uh, performing arts centers, Broadway performing arts centers, and the show, the audiences were going gaga over it, flipping out. Now, we, I knew I knew they would, and I'm, I don't say that you know boastfully. I'm just saying we had seen it already at all the corporate events, so we knew the show worked. It's just how do we get it to the performing arts centers and Broadway tour? Once that happened, all of a sudden people are going crazy. And I turned to my co-producer who had a lot of experience at this time of doing these things. And I said, how long, you know, he says, we have a hit. I said, oh my God, 
how long is that going to last? He said, uh, that should last like two or three years. I said, oh, my <laughs> God, two or three years. Oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. Well, that was 22 years ago, you know, so or, or even longer. So, you know, it, it was that moment of kind of that I realized that we had hit on something in terms of the touring market. And then as far as the composing end of things I did, you know, I did what every composer did. I started small off off Broadway, off Broadway. And then finally, you know, I had a major show, The Prince and the Pauper produced at the Lambs Theater that ran for two years. They got a great review in the New York Times. And, and that was validating. So that, that was helpful to feel like I, I, I belonged. How did you learn the mechanics of it? of writing a, a screenplay, of finding the rhythm with the music. It was right after I wrote uh, my first musical in, in college and I went back to my, my old teacher and I said, I feel like I, I don't have enough. I, I need to be able to, you know, orchestrate and I want to be able to do, a, and he looked at me, he said, Neil, because I'd always written songs and he'd always heard them. And he said, Neil, you have a gift for putting lyrics and music together to tell story. He said, let other people, there are people that all they do is go to school to orchestrate and all they do is do those other things. You stick with your gift. Then it was me saying, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to learn the craft of it. And let me tell you, there is a craft. When you learn the craft, you learn the mechanics, no different than engineer learns the tools to do how they're going to you know, work on something or an architect. It's how you build a show. You know, for example, the first song of a musical usually is the last song written. Once you find out what you know, what the theme is. The first the song that the major character sings is their want song. What, I, what the major character wants because we as composers or want to plant the seed for the audience so the audience hooks onto the main character of what they want. So now they're vested in the journey. So now they're rooting for the main character. They're rooting for Tony, right? For to get Maria or to, you know, for something's coming, he doesn't know what. You're, 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 that's the second song. And then there's a, yeah, I'm not going to give a whole lesson in writing musical theater here, but since I was so passionate about it, and if you want to be great at something, then you learn and you and you you make mistakes, fearlessness of, of making mistakes. I, I wrote some real crap when I was younger and I had to because it was a learning process, uh, you know, because you, you have to it, it, you have to know the rules. And once you know the rules, then you can break them. Right. That's the old adage. So that's what uh, that's what I did. I imagine that these are some of the messages that you pass along to students. I know you're very generous with your time and give back. Take me through when you're, you're back on campus and doing those master classes. Oh, it's great. You know, usually what I'll do is uh, I'll go into the musical theater, you know, class and you know, I'll give a, a little talk. You know, I, I, I think it's much better when they're not talked at it, when it's better when it's interactive. So I'll, I'll get a few students. I'll, I'll make sure that a few of them have songs prepared or maybe they'll sing a song of mine I'll send up there and and then we'll talk about that and how to go through it and what better way uh, to present the song or look at the song or how to do a song without stepping on the toes of their college professors because we're all working together there's different goals that we you know uh, that we're all trying to attain as as mentors the other thing I tell the students is this um the people who are getting the leads in the shows in college and high school are usually not the people who end up having the careers in, uh, in the world of, of theater. And I said, and I want to take note to all the people who are doing leads in the shows right now because you, you, it's the people who are beneath it who want it more. They're, they're the ones who say, I could do that. And they work twice as hard because they're not going to be stopped. So I say, if you have a lead, then you better find a way to work twice as hard as that person who wants to work twice as hard as you to get it. 
I said also the types of characters, Asians you are, when you go to a casting director, they might not be looking for your type. They might be looking. A lot of it, you know, there's, there's people from my, my years who have had wonderful careers who were not necessarily the leads. So it's not always the case, but to any student, if you're not the big man on campus now, trust me, you can be the big man in campus of life later on. You just got to keep growing and wanting it. And that's the truth. And that was me. Shifting to the present day, we were talking before uh, we got on air about a project that sums up your two passions perfectly in baseball and theater with uh, you working on a Pete Rose musical. Tell me about that. Charlie Hustle. Yeah, a musical about Pete Rose. Well, I always wanted to write a musical about baseball, baseball related. So uh, I, I, I was passionate about the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. And through my contacts, uh, you know, I, I was exploring that. I actually became good friends with Hank Aaron and his wife. I'm still good friends with Hank's wife, Billy Aaron, and had a, you know, able to explore the history of the Negro Leagues. But that project never got off the ground. And I was, uh, my agent just happened to get a, a script from a writer who had written, who wrote for Saturday Night Live. Ryan Noggle is his name. He also was out in LA writing TV sitcoms, but he always wanted to write a musical. He was a baseball fanatic. And most specifically, he grew up uh, right outside Cincinnati. And so he was exploring uh, a musical about Pete Rose. And my agent, she got the script and she said to the writer, she said, there's only one person on the planet who should be writing the music for this project. And it's Neil Berg. And she, and I believe, and, and she's right because, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if there's anybody else who has the background in baseball <laughs> as a composer of musical theater that, like I do. It's, uh, it's a fascinating story, I can tell you that. And we did the first presentation. Uh, and uh, I invited my good friend, Eric Spitz, yes. who you know very well, uh, you know, from WFAN, who I went to college with. And he, in turn, put me in touch with Maggie Gray from Binghamton, who came to see it and uh, to get their opinions in the first draft. And everyone seems to love it. And we're going to be doing the second presentation once COVID ends, hopefully by May or June. Not ends, but it allows us to do our work. So very excited about writing a baseball musical. But I will tell everybody else, in the meantime, I have another musical called The Twelve that won the, the Henry Award for Best New Musical when we presented it in Denver at the Denver Center, and that's coming to Broadway. So look for that, uh, The Twelve. And my musical, if I wrote for Warner Brothers, Grumpy Old Men, uh, we did with Hal Linden and Sally Struthers and uh, had a great run uh, bef before COVID and hopefully once after COVID uh, you know, lifts its uh, outside of this fog. Uh, people all around the, the country and the world will get to see uh, Grumpy Old Men, the musical. Well, wishing you only continued success in all those ventures. Of course, Eric, a previous alumni Bearcat Chats guest and a terrifically accomplished uh, Bearcat. And so I could talk to you for hours, Neil. Really appreciate the time. And uh, thanks so much uh, for your generosity to the university. Hey, go Bearcats or go Colonials for all, <laughs> all folk. Okay, whatever you are, Binghamton, Binghamton rocks.